good day, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to Bell Ring Brands Quarter Fiscal Year 2024 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone. You will then hear an automated message advising your hand is raised. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Jennifer Meyer, Investor Relations for Bell Ring Brands. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for Bell Ring Brands Second Quarter Fiscal 2024 Earnings Call. With me today are Darcy Davenport, our President and CEO, and Paul Rode, our CFO. Darcy and Paul will begin with prepared remarks, and afterwards we'll have a brief question and answer session. The press release and supplemental slide presentation that supports these remarks are posted on our website in both the Investor Relations and the SEC Filing sections at bellring.com. In addition, the release and slides are available on the SEC's website. Before we continue, I would like to remind you that this call will contain forward-looking mm-hmm. statements which are subject to risks and uncertainties that should be carefully considered by investors as actual results could differ materially from these statements. These forward-looking statements are current as of the date of this call, and management undertakes no obligation to update these statements. As a reminder, this call is being recorded and an audio replay will be available on our website. And finally, this call will discuss certain non-GAAP measures. For reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures to the nearest GAAP measure, see our press release issued yesterday and posted on our website. With that, I will turn the call over to Darcy. Thanks, Jennifer, and thank you all for joining us. Last evening, we reported our second quarter results and posted a supplemental presentation to our website. I'm happy to share that we had an excellent first half with Q2 results above our expectations. The business continues to accelerate as we bring on new shake capacity and begin to drive demand. For the first time since 2021, we executed two successful club promotions in one quarter, which sparked a ton of consumer and retailer excitement. Net sales grew 28% over prior year and adjusted EBITDA was up 53%. Our greater than expected shake demand, specifically non-promoted, drove the net sales and adjusted EBITDA margin outperformance. As you saw in yesterday's press release, we raised our outlook for the year. We now expect net sales to grow 16 to 19% over fiscal 23 and adjusted EBITDA to grow 18 to 24%. This raise at the top and the bottom line was based on better than expected first half performance, strong consumption trends, confidence in our capacity expansion, and our decision to execute a price increase on shakes late in Q4. Moving to shake production, we have made remarkable progress in our plan to grow and diversify our shake supply. We are making more shakes every quarter with Q2 production coming in as expected and up significantly versus the year ago quarter. We remain on track to grow production north of 20% this year, enabling strong net sales growth in 24 and increased weeks of supply by year end. Now to the category and brand updates. The convenient nutrition category grew 5% in Q2 as tailwinds around health and wellness and fitness continued to drive growth. Consumer interest in functional beverages and sports nutrition products continues to be high with mainstream, ready-to-drink brands driving most of the growth and bringing new households into the category. RTD led the category up 10%, driven by promotions and distribution gains. Ready-to-mix grew 3%, slowing this quarter as consumers traded down to value brands and switched to other high-protein products, including RTDs. Despite this change in consumer behavior, our powder brands still outperform the tracked category. Premier protein shake consumption growth remained strong this quarter at 29%. Growth was robust across all channels in Q2, driven by promotions, strong velocities, and distribution expansion. The highest growth was in mass and e-commerce. Mass benefited from display activity and distribution gains, while e-commerce saw strong growth behind promotional events. The club channel, boosted by successful promotions at both of the major club retailers, drove healthy volume lifts and household penetration. 
April consumption remains strong, up 16%, despite some out-of-stocks in track channels. Flavors continue to drive retailer and consumer excitement. Our newest 30-gram flavor cookie dough is performing well with top 10% velocities in mass. Our seasonal flavor, salted caramel popcorn, saw solid success. Our brand metrics remain healthy. Premier Protein with RTD market share of 21% remained its top, rema- maintained its top position as the number one brand in the RTD segment, as well as the number one in the broader convenient nutrition category. TDPs grew 33% over the prior year quarter, but saw a slight sequential decline. With shake supply remaining tight and demand greater than expected this quarter, we experienced some temporary out-of-stocks late in the quarter and into April. Retailer inventory levels are starting to improve, with TDPs stabilizing, and we expect further improvement throughout the second half. I'm pleased to see the brand reach another all-time high in household penetration this quarter, reaching over 18% of households. Premier Protein added one percentage point of household penetration versus Q1 and grew 26% over prior year. As of Q1, the brand was a significant contributor to the overall RTD category growth. Premier Protein's household penetration continues to be the highest in the category and we expect modest growth in the remainder of fiscal 24. With the RTD segment's household penetration below categories such as nutrition bars and energy drinks, we still see tremendous opportunity to grow in our existing channels. Premier Protein Powder continued its strong trajectory, growing 52% in Q2 behind brand investments, distribution gains, and strong velocities. We remain encouraged by the growth potential of the Premier Protein brand in this format. Premier Powders continue to bring mainstream consumers into the category with 80% of its growth coming from outside the category. Its household penetration reached 1.7% this quarter, and we continue to believe that the brand will be a contributor to mainstreaming the powder category in the same way Premier did for the ready-to-drink category. Our licensing strategy continues to perform well with cereal and frozen pancakes, attracting new consumers to the brand. Although not a significant revenue driver, these two products boost Premier's overall household penetration to 19%, or nearly one in five households. Turning to Diamondize, U.S. consumption remains strong in mainstream FDM channels, but overall consumption declined 8%, weighed down by ongoing softness in specialty channels and increased competitive activity in e-commerce. Despite these headwinds, I'm encouraged to see the brand maintain its record high household penetration with TDPs and share holding steady. Looking forward, we are increasing our investment behind the brand, both in marketing and promotion. We are excited to expand our national marketing campaign with San Francisco All-Pro running back Christian McCaffrey. We are eager to see the impact that enhanced digital marketing and a top-tier influencer will have on the brand awareness and household penetration. Last, we are putting the final touches on innovation that will expand Dimatize's product line. Overall, we continue to be bullish on the mainstream powder opportunity with two complementary brands. In closing, our excellent first half results position us well for an above algorithm fiscal year. Our confidence in the long-term outlook for Bellring remains strong. Our brands are leaders in the highest growth areas of an on-trend category. Ready to drink and powder segments are in the early stages of growth with major tailwinds. Premier Protein and Diamatize are leading mainstream brands with low household penetration and strong loyalty. Our momentum continues to grow on shakes as we layer, start to layer in promotion. Our shake capacity plan is on track to support many years of, future, of robust growth. I'm excited to see the momentum continue into 2025 as we layer in more innovation and national marketing. Thank you for your interest in our company. We look forward to sharing our progress next quarter. I'll now turn the call over to Paul. Thanks, Darcy. Good morning, everyone. Net sales for the quarter were $495 million, up 28% over prior year, above our expectations with strong demand for Premier Protein Shakes, the biggest driver of the outperformance. Adjusted EBITDA was $104 million, an increase of 53%. Adjusted, adjusted EBITDA margins were 21% and also exceeded our expectations, benefiting from favorable gross margins and leverage on higher net sales. Starting with brand performance, 
Premier Protein net sales grew 34% behind strong volume growth for RTD shakes and powders. Promotional activity, distribution gains, and organic growth drove the increase in net sales. Shake consumption dollars grew 29% compared to shipment growth of 34%, with the difference driven primarily by the labbing of a prior year trade inventory deload. Diamondized net sales increased 5% this quarter as the brand benefited from increased distribution and promotional activity in domestic mainstream channels, along with international strength. These gains were partially offset by continued weakness in the specialty channel and increased e-commerce competitive activity. Gross profit of $164 million grew 40%, with an increase in gross profit margin of 280 basis points to 33.2%. The margin increase resulted from net input cost deflation, partially offset by incremental promotional activity. Compared to our expectations, gross margins benefited from greater than expected non-promoted volume and non-recurring cost favorability. SG&A expenses as a percentage of net sales were 14% and roughly flat to prior year. Advertising and promotion spend increased $3 million but was flat as a percentage of net sales at 3.1%. Before reviewing our outlook, I would like to make a few comments on cash flow and liquidity. We generated $16 million in cash flow from operations in the second quarter and $90 million in the first half. We expect net working capital growth in fiscal 24 to modestly exceed our net sales growth rate as we add weeks of shake supply in the second half. As of March 31, net debt was $761 million and net leverage was 1.9 times. With our EBITDA growth and strong cash flow generation, we anticipate net leverage will remain below two times in fiscal 24. With respect to our share repurchases this quarter, we bought 400,000 shares at an average price of $56.46 per share, or $23 million in total. Our remaining share repurchase authorization is $289 million. Turning to our outlook, we raised our fiscal 24 guidance for net sales to be $1.93 to $1.99 billion and adjusted EBITDA of $400 to $420 million. Our guidance implies strong top-line growth of 16 to 19%, and adjusted EBITDA growth of 18 to 24%, with healthy adjusted EBITDA margins of 20.9% at the midpoint. The updated guidance reflects our better than expected first half results and strong consumption trends. In the second half of fiscal 24, product and logistics costs are expected to increase compared to the first half, with pricing actions on shake planned late in the fourth quarter. At the midpoint, our second half net sales are expected to grow 13%, with adjusted EBITDA margins of approximately 20%. As we enter the second half, we have largely lapped the relaunch shake flavors and expect sales growth to be driven by continued organic momentum and distribution gains. Compared to the second half of fiscal 23, we expect EBITDA margins to be similar. Turning to the third quarter, our net sales growth is expected to largely track our second half growth rate. Premier Protein drives this growth as volumes are expected to increase in the mid to high teens. Diamondized partially offsets Premier's strong growth, with the brand facing a tough prior year comparable in Q3 as it laps a club load-in and FDM display activity. Just EBITDA margins are expected to improve modestly from the year-ago quarter, with significantly higher gross margins as we lap peak protein prices. This increase is mostly offset by incremental marketing spend and SG&A as a percentage of net sales. In closing, we're pleased with our first half momentum. Our strong first half results give us greater confidence in our full year outlook and long term growth prospects. I will now turn it over to the operator for questions. Thank you. As a reminder to ask a question, please press star 1 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 1 1 again. Please stand by while we compile the QA roster. Our first question comes from the line of Ken Goldman from J.P. Morgan. Hi, thank you, and good morning. Um, I wanted to get a sense a little bit of, um, you know, I think you mentioned that non-promoted sales of Premier did quite well this quarter, too. And I'm just curious if I heard you right there, what do you attribute the acceleration kind of in those base products to in light of, you know, how well the promoted products uh, did at the same time? Is there a you know, natural correlation between the two just in terms of news generation, or or am I playing that up too much in my head? Uh, Good morning, Ken. Um, So what still, what has been true and what continues to be true is about 80% of our growth comes from outside of the category. 
So we continue to get a ton of um, new households into the category, showed on our all-time high of household penetration this quarter and the one-point jump up. Um, I mean, in general, the more we ship, the more we sell. Um, and we really haven't had healthy fill rates in FDM yet. Um, and so, um, honestly, this quarter was, we saw, you know, strong promotions um, in our two club customers. Pretty much what we expected to see, but what was higher was um, actually the non-promoted in, um, in pretty much all channels outside of those promotional periods. Understood. Thank you. And then as we think about, you know, the guidance raise, um, you know, and we look ahead um, toward the upper end of that range, um, is there potential, and I'm not trying to, you know, fish for even higher guidance than what you've already looked at, but I'm just trying to get a sense of it. If, if, if there is demand there, how much above sort of the high end of your sales guide could you potentially get to, just given some of the capacity constraints that have, you know, been mentioned so far? We have, we have production that can absolutely satisfy, um, you know, the full range of our guidance, obviously. Um, as I've said on past calls, um, you know, we need to, we do not have enough internal inventory. We need to build safety stock. However, toward the end of the year, we plan to get up to, you know, our target of six to eight weeks. You know, if demand continues to be robust, then we have the flexibility to toggle between, you know, building more inventory versus going, you know, and satisfying sales. Um, so I think we've always said that we're going to be nimble this year um, just because of that we are, you know, building um, safety stocks, internal inventory. Um, but, um, you know, rest assured that we have the production to satisfy the high end, um, you know, our full guidance. Um, and then we're going to have to just assess the situation in Q4 to see if we're going to build inventory or, you know, satisfy it if there's, if there's more demand than expected. Great. Thank you, Darcy. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of David Palmer from Evercore ISI. Thanks. Uh, good morning. Uh, it was obviously a pretty dynamic quarter with uh, some of the ramp up and promotion mix with the two club promotions. Uh, and, and, but at the same time, you had the strong gross margins. So I wanted to kind of double click on those two things. You know, what were some of the learnings, uh, both in and out of expectation from the increase in merchandising from the quarter? Uh, and and I, I know this, what you mentioned the two. I was wondering if that meant that that was on unusual or if this is pretty close to the norm that you would expect in terms of the impact to price mix from promotional activity in, in the upcoming quarters? Uh, hey, Paul, I'll start with learnings and then you can hit on any price mix uh, yep. different things. So uh, the learnings from the promotion. So remember, we haven't done um, really any significant club promotions or promotions at all since 2021. So it's been a while. Um, so we weren't exactly sure what to expect. Um, honestly, there was a ton of excitement. Um, I've talked about this before. The key to for our success on promotion is display. Um, get out of the aisle, get new people to see our product. Um, and that is where we increase household penetration. We get the bump and stick for the brand. It has been true for the entire time this brand has been around. So sure enough, that is exactly what happened. Um, we got great displays um, and a ton of retailer support for the events, um, and that that flowed straight into strong results. So I would say I don't think it's a lot of new learnings, but more confidence that the fundamentals of the brand are very much intact and there's a ton of excitement from consumers and retailers. And then on 
pricing, we always expected the second quarter to be the most significant headwind on pricing because of the significant promotional activity that we were doing on shakes. As we entered in the second half, um, we still expect some light promotion in Q4 on shakes, but really from a pricing perspective, it's pretty balanced in, this, in the rest of the year. We aren't expecting major headwinds or tailwinds in any given quarter on pricing. And then as we get late in Q4, uh, we are modeling a, a light benefit in the fourth quarter on pricing, but again, it's late in the quarter, so it's a pretty modest benefit. It's more about 25, but net-net, not a lot of, uh, at least on shakes, not a lot of pricing um, really impact there. And then just on that gross margin, thanks for that. Uh, the 300 or so basis points expansion there, you know, how would you describe that? Maybe, you know, build up to the 300 in the quarter, and how should we think about that going forward? In your questions compared to a year ago? Around, around gross margins. I think if you had to, I know it's hard to break out it specifically how many basis points are due to each thing, but if you had to talk about, uh, commodity uh, price mix and then volume leverage uh, net of promotions you know how would you think about the gross margin expansion this quarter uh, and and then how does that apply to the second half thanks sure so from a gross margin perspective significant expansion was from lower protein cost so as you may recall last year we had very high protein costs, especially on our powder business in Q2 and into Q3. So if you think about last year's um, business, you know, last year by quarter, the second and third quarter were by far the highest protein cost. And then in the, Q, in the fourth quarter, they started to pull back, which is why you see stronger gross margins in our fourth quarter a year ago. So as you look at Q2 specifically, significant expansion at the gross margin line, um, that's partially offset by, you know, significant promotion offsetting uh, that. We also saw about 50 basis points of favorability from what I would call just some non-recurring items. So, you know, command true-ups, payments for missing on minimum volumes, that's about 50 basis points. But most of the expansion is just protein costs offset by, by promotion. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Thomas Palmer from City. Good morning, and thanks for the question. I wanted to maybe start off um, back on the input cost environment. Uh, it sounded like you're, you're expecting less favorability as we move through the year, but you also noted 3Q a year ago was a bit elevated along with, with that second quarter. So is it kind of less deflation as we move into 3Q? And then is, is there a point we kind of return to inflation, or is that more a fiscal 25 consideration? Yeah, so if you look at the second half, we are expecting cost to go up from the second quarter, mostly on our powders, which go up significantly. Uh, it's about a 50% increase from Q2 to Q3, so it's significant. Shakes start to, to modestly head up higher in the third and fourth quarter on proteins. So from a sequential basis, increases. Versus a year ago, um, we still see fairly – fairly significant favorability um, on proteins in the third quarter, but it does start to significantly moderate in the fourth quarter. So there's a very little benefit in the fourth quarter, uh, but still pretty significant favorability in the third quarter. And again, that's just the dynamics of lapping last year's high kind of peaks at Q2, Q3 last year. And we're seeing kind of the, the um, I'll call it the, the floor in the current the current uh, protein environment here in the second quarter, then it starts to head up again. So that's that's the dynamic. So they, we still we still should see some favorability in the second half, but mostly in the third quarter on our proteins. Okay, thanks for that. And then just on marketing, I think one thing you've talked about in, in recent quarters is kind of some flexibility to, to pull back on marketing if demand is, is running particularly strong. And I, I realize some of this is, that you're talking about with marketing is a shift maybe between brands, but it, it does seem like Premier, you've got – kind of limited safety stock, very robust demand in the quarter. Um, to what extent are, are we seeing kind of a shift there with, with a pullback in, in Premier versus a ramp up in Dimatize? And how does that kind of net out as we think about the second half versus what you'd planned on initially? Yeah, yeah. we have decided to – oops, I'll start and then you can add, Paul. Perfect. Um, we decided to pull back um, to we and move the the major – 
you know, equity campaign to from Q4 this year to 25. Um, but we pivoted um, some of those dollars to both Premier Powder, Premier Bottles, and Dimatize. So um, think of kind of the Tetra side of our business on Premier as being the constraint, constrained side. Um, but so we're still spending, but on the other parts of our business, but not just Dimatize. So um, definitely spending on Premier Powder and, and Bottles. And just to expand, yeah, I mean, we we'd called previously for, you know, low threes, kind of three, three and a half percent for the year. We're still in that ballpark. As Darcy said, we have toggled a little bit between brands and pulled back slightly from maybe from our prior expectation, but but it's it's a modest, modest change. Great. Right. Thank you for the color. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Brian Spillane from Bank of America. Uh, thanks, operator. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, to just two, two, one, one, a clarification, Paul. Just, um, just following the, the the discussion around gross margins and the back half of the year. So, will gross margins um, be up a little bit more in the third quarter versus last year than? They will be in the fourth quarter. I mean, it sounded it's sounding to me like three Q, four Q should be roughly similar. Maybe three Q a little better because you won't have as much promo, and then four Q a little less gross margin expansion. But just want to make sure I was hearing that correctly. Yeah, you've got it correct. So we we don't see you know Q three Q four ought to be pretty similar from a margin perspective uh, at gross margin, and you're correct that you will see from a year ago perspective much more favorability in the third quarter than the fourth, and that's the protein dynamics as proteins start to step up in, a, in, our, in our second half where they started to step down in last year's Q4. So that's why the, the favorability is less in Q4, but still favorable. All right. Thank you. And then, Darcy, c- can you talk a little bit about um, the, and rather than household penetration, just kind of how the, 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 the sort of consumer base is, is changing if it has so I guess what I'm what I'm think what I'm what I'm asking is just are you recruiting more kids um, you know male versus female age cohorts you know it, initially you know this was a pretty relatively narrow consumer base but I'm just curious if it's expanding and and I ask that I guess in the context of you know I think when with Fairlife and 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 core power um, you know, they're definitely seeing a pretty wide age cohort, especially young, uh, drinking it. So I'm just curious, with Premier Shake specifically, right, if, if you're beginning to kind of widen the, the consumer base. We definitely are. Um, not kids, though. This is definitely an adult brand. I mean, it's, you know, high protein, so, um, but it is more of an adult brand. Um, but absolutely, as we, honestly, like, both, the Coke side of the business and our side, um, we're the ones driving the category growth um, with these new households. So we are bringing in, yes, we're bringing in younger people, but um, honestly, like with such a a low household penetration brand, we're bringing in just a really diverse set of age and uh, gender, et cetera. So um, what's unique about Premier, um, and I, I know I've talked to you guys about this, is our ability to really source volume from um, all ages, kind of um, people looking for different things. So number one reason why people enter Premier is to lose weight. Um, but we also source volume from the adult nutrition side of the business, from sports nutrition. We range, our, our range of consumers is very, very wide. And, it, and we actually, more than many other brands out there, we actually have a pretty even split of gender. So what is magical about this brand is just how broad it is and that you can see that in our consumer um, the consumers that we're bringing into the brand 
Okay. Thanks, Darcy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Robert Moscow from TD Cowan. Hi, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I think in your prepared remarks, you said that TD points uh, are showing signs of stabilization in most recent periods, and that you know the out of stocks have stabilized. Um, how soon do you think it will be before you can get those um, ramping higher again? Like, is it in the next few weeks we should expect TDPs to start recovering higher or not? Thanks. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see improvement kind of every every month. Um, so we'll see improvement throughout Q3, um, and then we'll get back to you know kind of all time highs uh, in Q4. Right. Okay, great. And then a quick follow up. Um, you know, th these club promos you did were obviously very successful. Um, do you think your competitors are going to conduct similar promotions? Um, in the second half of the year, and if so, does that does that present any like risk of a shock to your demand in that channel, or or not? So, from a club promotion standpoint, I mean, most competitors are already doing promotion. Um, so, there's an exception of um, you know the the um, Fair Life hasn't been doing um, promotions, but um, I expect them to, when they get in a good supply, in, in a supply situation, that they will as well. Um, but we're pretty complimentary. I mean, I always go back to, I always go back to that there is room for two strong brands in a low household penetration, um, high growth category. Um, and we have both been very successful in every single channel, but specifically in the club channel. Great. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Kaumil Gajrawala from Jeffries. Uh, hey, guys. Good morning, uh, and well done. Uh, can you talk a bit about aisle placement? I think for quite some time it was about moving, you know, the products to other parts of the of the store. And with the business still being so sort of linked to feature and display and pulling them out of the aisles, are you able to shift where in the store you are or increase uh, the number of places you are within the store? Um, our, so our focus right now, well, our focus right now is just really good at in stocks <laughs> um, within the pharmacy. Um, we are, you know, as I said earlier, uh, display is a huge driver for us. So we still think that there is a lot of upside within the pharmacy just getting displays kind of outside of the pharmacy. Um, longer term, we do see, so think of it just as incremental incremental display. That could include some incremental placement. We already are, so for instance, um, in some mass retailers and food retailers, we have singles up in the cooler, so it's more for like a grab and go. So we're aggressively going after those kind of opportunities. So. You know, to answer your question, yes, we are absolutely looking for the more places we can be in the store to kind of to introduce our brand to more people, the better. I think that eventually, more in kind of the medium, longer term, um, we do think it's interesting to actually change aisles. But for now, we think that there's a ton of upside just through building our base business within the pharmacy section and then getting incremental pace placement and display throughout the store. Okay, great. And on the price increase, um, maybe just some more details on, 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 the, on why is it linked to where costs are? Because it looks like it's coming through just as capacity is going to kick up again. Um, so just any more details on the thought process behind the uh, price increase? Sure. Yeah, we have seen some. We've seen cost increases in command costs, logistics, packaging, 
Um, and so, and actually, you know, many of our competitors have taken price. Um, so uh, we are, you know, our biggest competitor took price in Q1. Um, so this is, on, and mainly it's because the entire category is really seeing rising costs. Um, honestly, outside of kind of dairy inputs. However, dairy inputs are also supposed to, as Paul talked about, to, to start rising again. So um, it's late in the year. We talked about late in Q4. Um, and I think that we feel comfortable with our price difference versus competition after the price increase. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for next question. Our next question comes from the line of Jim Solera from Stevens. Hi, guys. Good morning. Thanks for taking our question. Uh, Darcy, I wanted to drill down a little bit on the, the TDPs that you mentioned uh, from the out-of-stocks. Do you have any sense for what retailers did uh, with those shelf placements as there was some out-of-stocks? They flex bars in? Did they move a competitor in? Uh, just any color there would be helpful. So what we know is no space. We didn't lose any space. Um, so that is where, you know, we knew that it was going to be temporary. And and honestly, Jim, it's, um, they're sporadic. So they're, so for what, what happens is that you know, we have certain flavors of four count going out for a period of time, then 12 count. Um, and so the space retailers, honestly, there are holes in the, there are holes in, on the shelf um, occasionally. So it's not about that, I mean, maybe they expand the products on the shelf to kind of fill in the holes. But the idea is that it is for a relatively short period of time, and it's never so broad that the entire brand is off the shelf. Okay, that's helpful. And, and then I guess as a follow-up to that, do you have the ability to see, you know, for example, if if my favorite flavor isn't on shelf, do I just then reach for chocolate, which is, you know, two slots down, or does that typically end up in just kind of a lost sale? Yeah, you're describing the challenge with forecasting <laughs> because what we're finding is that, yes, there's, for the most part, there, especially because our biggest capacity constraints has been on four count, um, so consumers will just change to a different, most of the time, to a different flavor. Um, every once in a while, they'll also change to a different pack type, so you know, four counts not four count chocolates not available. They'll go to to twelve count chocolate, for instance. There's even some channel shifting, so they might go to a different channel because it might be available there. So that is the challenge of forecasting accurately because there's so much interplay between the flavors and the pack sizes. For the most part, they are staying within the brand. Um, every once, you know. There, there are, you know, times, and I would say it's more the minority, that if somebody has a, flavor, a favorite flavor, they will just kind of wait to purchase for that, um, that cycle, and then they'll see if it's back on the shelf the next time they shop. Great. I appreciate the color. I'll hop back in the queue. Thank you. One moment for next question. Our next question comes from the line of Matt Smith from Stiefel. Hi, good morning. I wanted to ask Paul a follow-up question about the third quarter guidance. You said it was tracking to the implied second half growth rates for, for revenue. That implies fairly even phasing of growth in the second half of the year with a tougher comparison in the fourth quarter. Do I have that right? And can you talk about the phasing of promotional activity for the rest of the year? Are there any large incremental events year over year that we should be aware of? Yes, you are tracking it correctly that we would expect growth to be pretty pretty similar in Q3 and Q4 compared to a year ago. Uh, in the fourth quarter, we have some light promotion, but uh, it's not – it's nothing. We had. We also had some promotion, light promotion on shakes in the fourth quarter of last year. So I think it, overall, there's not 
a dramatic change in promotion, uh, promotional activity between the years. Thank you. And just one more follow-up for me, and I'll pass it on after. Um, the shipments were in line with consumption in the current quarter. Do you expect that to persist through the second half of the year, or is there a p potential for retailers to start to increase their inventory levels exiting the year? Our expectation is that shipments and consumption will largely track. It, it would likely um, modestly a swing towards the shipments, you know, it's a little bit of a inventory load, but nothing, we're not expecting anything dramatic uh, in the second half. So again, we're trying to replenish shelves uh, as well as keep up with the demand. So we would expect a little bit of shipments above consumption in the second half. Great. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Matt McGinley from Needham. Thank you. You noted the uh, increased e-commerce competition for Dynatize this quarter. Can you expand on what you saw there competitively, and is that something you expect to persist, or is that something that was more unique to this quarter? Um, yeah, this one was a new one. Um, so obviously Q2, new year, new you, we always see um, – increases in promotion and marketing because it's the time when the most most new people enter into the category. But this year was much more extreme than in the past, meaning a ton of more of the emerging brands, so the smaller brands, doing very deep discounting and, and um, really leaning into marketing. So um, highly competitive, and I would say, and that's very much the entire powder category. Um, we also saw some um, consumers seeking value, so not only buying brands on deal that I just referenced, but also some trading down um, to value brands, um, and then even staying what we saw what in Dimatize is actually buying looking for value, but actually upsizing. So going from a 20 serve, for instance, to a five pound because it was a better value. So a lot of deal shopping in general, just value seeking. Um, and from if we, we do we expect it to continue? Um, it continued in April. So I think in general, we expect that it will continue through um, through Q3. I think the big question is, in the powder category, when commodities decrease, for the most part, competitors invest that money into promotion. Well, now prices, um, commodities are going to start increasing again. So we do believe that there will be less deep discounting because of that. Yeah, that makes sense. And one quick follow-up on, on the revenue trend in the back half. Um, it's, it's a little bit difficult to tease out your seasonal trends given all the volatility you've had in the supply chain for the past few years. But do you expect the third quarter to generate more revenue than you did in the second, or, or does that step down? We would expect it to modestly increase from the second quarter sequentially. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of John Anderson from William Blair. Hey, good morning, thank you for the questions. Uh, two quick ones, um, I was just hoping you could give us an update on um, your kind of capacity plans, not for the balance of 24, but looking out to 25 and supporting growth in, in 2025, what, what your expectation is there in terms of shake capacity additions. And then the second question is just on powders. Uh, it looks like Premier Protein Powder was up, uh, consumption was up uh, very nicely in the quarter, dimatize a bit softer. Um, are you seeing anything in the market that would uh, you know, have you maybe thinking about balancing your resources against those two equities differently going forward? Uh, in the powder segment. Thank you. The production first. Um, so 25 production. We feel good about the 
the production increases. So just, I know you weren't asking about 24, um, but, you know, on track for 20% plus um, production increase. And remember, that was always back and loaded. Um, so we are expected to see strong production. We saw strong production in Q2, and that will continue into Q3 and Q4 of this year. When we go into 25, that will continue into 25. So um, without specific numbers, you know, we have enough production to support high end of our algo plus buffer capacity plus any – so the – needed production to rebuild internal inventory if we do not get back to target levels by the end of 24. So I feel really good about the production ramp up. Um, just know that we are still scaling up our two greenfield facilities, and so those start um, every quarter becoming more and more important. So that's one piece. Um, secondly, around powder, um, the one thing I didn't say when I was talking about e-com and the dynamic of um, consumers seeking value, Premier has been a big beneficiary of that. So um, think of Dimatize as being kind of a super premium athlete's brand. Well, Premier is very much a mainstream powder brand um, that is a good value. And so um, we've actually seen one of the reasons why Premier is doing so well is because of the dynamic going on. So yes, um, to answer your question, I think it's less about diverting resources from Dynatize to Premier Powder, but we have the we have the ability to support both businesses, um, and we will continue to increase the support on Premier Powder because um, we're really encouraged by that format. And I mean, I said it in my prepared remarks, but we believe with 80% of the growth coming from outside of the category, we really think that Premier can help mainstream the powder category very much like the brand did for RTD. So we're really bullish on the opportunity with Premier Powder. Great, thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of John Baumgartner from Mizuho Securities. Good morning. Thanks for the question. Um, maybe first off, uh, just wanted to follow up on promo, Darcy, and, and getting more display outside of the aisle. Um, you know, right now this category and brand stand out for growth and, and retailer interest follows, but that also takes you into greater, you know, I guess conflict or overlap for space with other food and beverage that's maybe higher margin for the retailer or I guess even general merchandise. Um, how do you think about sustaining outside the aisle merch over the longer term? I mean, is placement mostly contingent on retailers maintaining their interest in health and wellness shelf sets? Um, does the cost of display go up? Is outside the aisle just destined to be more of a, of a seasonal phenomenon? How do you think about that over time? It's an interesting question. So I can tell you that every single one of our conversations with retailers, um, they are they they see the trends within health and wellness, they see the growth coming from this category and specifically RTDs. Um, and it is stronger than almost any other category in the store. So it has the attention, it has the support. They also know that it's a low household penetration category, so the growth should continue. Um, so I think it's less about, you know, I think it's less concern around the, the retailer support and borrowing from other categories. I think it's there. Um, right now our conversations are really, um, and we're seeing it, is that um, space is increasing. Um, space is increasing not only for RTDs, but within, you know, and taking space from the other parts of the business or the other segments. 
um, but also increasing the overall space for convenient nutrition. So if you're talking about displays, um, obviously it's more competitive, um, but the retailers see, you know, appear to be very excited about the opportunity, and I've never heard the margin push back as to giving, you know, display space versus other categories. Okay, thanks for that. And then in terms of diamondize and the e-commerce pressure there, you stress pricing as a big factor, but I'm curious, with, with the advantage diamondize has over these emerging brands and bricks and mortar and, and marketing resources, is there anything you can do in, in physical channels to drive more engagement, you know, more ingredients awareness, and, and sampling purchases that then converts back to stronger e-com sales even at the higher price points? Yeah, I think there's a lot Dimatize can do. I mean, I think that um, we learned we learned a fair amount this last quarter. I think it caught us a little um, caught us a little off guard the uh, that how aggressive a lot of these emerging brands were on e-com, um, and we had a we had a marketing campaign, um, but we were a little conservative on the weight. So our share of voice was lower than it needed to be. So I think ton of learning. Um, we're going to be aggressive on the back half, um, not only with um, marketing campaign across all channels, uh, but really supporting e-com. We're going to be, you know, looking at leaning a little more into promotion um, just to be competitive. And then um, also, just from a campaign standpoint, um, you know, really excited about Christian McCaffrey and being able to, that is just a timing thing of when we signed him and when we can actually get assets out there. So um, that's going to be really exciting to be able to lean into his celebrity um, and, and, and push that out. So, you know, Dimetize is an amazing brand. It's second second biggest whey protein brand on, um, on e-com. So I feel great about the business. Um, you know, a little bit of learning in Q2, um, but we, nothing that I, I don't think we can, you know, we'll be able to write it in the back half to get back to growth. Thanks, Darcy. Thanks. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Bill Chappelle from Truist Securities. Thanks. Thanks for squeezing me in. Uh, Darcy, just maybe a follow-up on Brian's question in terms of new consumers. And, and I just didn't know if there was a way to, to quantify, like, the percentage that are now male, the repeat rate, stuff like that, that you that you might have. And the reason I ask is, I, I just, and this is not specific to you, I just have a tough time with the household penetration uh, kind of metric because it would, you you cite that you have low household penetration, but then also being at 18, 19% seems like one in five households is pretty good household penetration for this, uh, for this stage of the, of the category. Or even if it, to say one in five households of a beverage category, it seems like you should be a lot bigger in revenue. So I'm just trying to to understand, you know, what does that mean, you know, or how do you look at the opportunity beyond household penetration, or even how do you quantify household penetration to kind of get you excited? Because it seems like repeat rate or, you know, quantifying new consumers into the category would be uh, helpful, at least to us, to to better understand the metric. Okay, so... Sorry, there's a lot in there. <laughs> no, I know it was. It's a great question, Val. So, okay, first of all, men, uh, male, female split. So, I think again, what's unique about Premier is it's a pretty even split. A little more male than female. So, call it call it 60, 40, 55, 45. Um, but you know, good split between male and female. That is unique. So, you think of the diet brands. You know, more women than men. Sports nutrition, more men than women. Um, most of the other brands in the category kind of have a specific lane and a defined consumer, and really it's hard because of the brand to get out of that. So that is one of the things that's really unique about Premier. So first of all, just hit that one. On the, 
on the household penetration and repeat rate. So here's the way I look at it. Um, first of all, strong category leading repeat rate, about 50%. Um, and on the household penetration, so we're you know right around, call it 18%. Um, the RTD shake category, about 45%. Convenient nutrition overall, about 75%. So overall, I think that like there is a lot of room. When I go to a, you know, a, another category which is relatively new, but more mature, or <laughs> relatively, those are kind of conflicting. Um, I guess about they're about the same age, so to speak, but bigger um, is energy, energy drinks. And when I look at that, the energy drink category, about the same household penetration as convenient nutrition, so call it 70, 75. But the number one market share and number two market share players are at 50%. So I look at that and I'm like, okay, so there is a ton of room to grow here. Um, knowing that the top two brands are bringing in a lot of new consumers, 80% of our growth is coming from outside of the category, and that and it's already coming from outside of the category, and we really haven't started marketing. That just tells me there is a ton of room to grow both the brand as well as the category. Does that help, Bill? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm sorry. I, I could probably keep going, but uh, I will – Keep the call short just and go to uh, diamondize one follow up. Do you think the the growth of Premier Powder is leading to some trade down that's affecting diamondize, or is it mainly discounting from other brands? Um, they're very different consumers. There is sure. not a lot of interaction. So um, definitely other brands. And Perfect. like I said, so the beauty again. Same dynamics between Premier RTD and Premier Powder. Over 80% of the growth on both businesses are coming from outside of the category. So it's less switching and trading down, but actually consumers are entering the powder category through Premier. Got it. Thanks so much for the color. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I am showing no further questions. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now all disconnect.